All right, welcome to the Esoteric Nerd Podcast. I'm your host, Edward. <laughs> and who something are, who, strange is happening? Yeah, something to him. strange is happening. He's he's transplanted into my body. See his mm-hmm. his wireless his five G wireless internet in India transported his soul into my body, and now I'm going to be Edward for the remainder of this podcast. Oh, it's all right. Sweet. Aquarians and Virgos have a lot in common. We're both very mercurial, so I'm I'm sure I can handle it. And here I was afraid that you were going to be RC the whole time. No, no, that guy <laughs> sucks. <laughs> yeah. And who we got? We got we have Joseph Zabinski, Frater Mercurio, and Matt. Yes, sir. We need to say more than just Matt, because after all those other names, that's sort of like, and the NPC. Frater ISCP. I like Whoa. it. I like it. Yes, sir. ISCP, man. That sounds so, Egyptian. Yeah, that sounds like inset to you. Does, yeah. So what's going on, for those who don't know, um, is that uh, you guys, we, uh, we're in the middle of a podcast with Edward, and his internet died in India, right? They, they, uh, mm. they, they, is that what happened? That's correct. Yes. Well, yeah. yeah. The connection went down. Okay. And uh, yeah, so uh, we can just pick off where he left off or do whatever we want, I guess. What should so we So we were discussing really, um, you know, Matt had some questions for us as a depth type, you know, some, and we, we had some really cool questions. So um, we were being interviewed by Matt, really. Mm-hmm. Frater ISCP. I will turn so, it uh, over to Frater, Frater uh, Matt, ISCP. And what order are you in, brother? Uh, right now, I'm just kind of doing my own thing, but uh, I was involved with the lodge in Toronto. With Zach? No, not with Zach. We had, that was the first thing we said, too. Yeah. <laughs> with, with what order? Like Cicero's? Yes. Yeah. yeah, correct. Yeah. They have a lodge in Toronto? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. But we're not cool. supposed to know that. I'm sure you can Google it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, they have a list of all their temples. They have a list. Actually, someone the other day just asked me, said, told me that I must be a member of the Cicero's Temple in Toronto, um, because because uh, and I and uh, yeah, and I was like, no, I live in Vancouver, where you live. And she's like, well, there's no Golden Dawn in Vancouver. I'm like, there's lots of Golden Dawn in Vancouver, just none that the Cicero's recognize, I guess. I mean, we got Frater Yeshi and the Thuban Temple and that whole order, which has the like. Uh, Who's in that? Chris, Chris Zaleski, Darcy Kuntz is in that, right? According to the website, I believe. And then there's other groups. So yeah, I think there. I was very, I was very saddened recently to see. Uh, um, who's the hierophant in England? Um, Sumner, yeah. Alex oh, Sumner. Alex Sumner. Yeah, yeah. pretend like uh, like you don't exist, and there's no other Golden Dawn in the UK. Like, you know, oh, like, really? yeah, yeah. He was very clear about that, about like, there's, there's no other groups here and there's no other options and there's no one else. It's like, and I, I was upset by that. Cause I'm like, you know, you're lying. You know, well, he, you're yeah. lying. You he know, you're me. actually lying. And, we go, we, yeah, we go to the so, same Masonic Lodge. So. Yeah. So mm-hmm. exactly. And I was just like, this is the kind of stuff that needs to stop in my opinion. Mm-hmm. When, Cause as long as this stuff's going on, like, we're talking about the tradition that I'm part of, like I that where my heart is. But it's hard to respect a tradition when you have representatives of it like behaving that way. So anyway, I hope. That However, I mean, leave that I, in the past. I do have to say that it's quite nice in some ways to be secret and anonymous and truly secret. You get a lot of control that way. You can, you know, you can. Mm. You can initiate whoever you want to initiate. If you don't want to, you don't have to. You know, you, it's very easy to maneuver when people don't know you're there. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. If and that, in fact, if we have quite a few members who are brand new to, to Magic or brand new to the Golden Dawn. So um, that's been really good, you know, really interesting. I, I, yeah, I don't think it's not a, I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily for you mm. to, to have that sort of, uh, you know, it's 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 disappointing to me to see a higher fan and a and a representative mm. like that behave, talk like this. I'm just yeah. I'm just so tired of it. 
Like I've been dealing with zinc since the nineties, you know, and, and, mm. and, you know, I've had, I had to deal with zinc. I've had Griffin break into my house. I've had other heads of current golden donors do vicious things to my family. Like I love the tradition, but that stuff, if it just doesn't ever get called out and if people just mm. put up with it, what do you, like, what do you think is going to happen? We've all seen now in the world, what happens when people, when us plebs neglect our responsibility in our roles in being a part of life, right? This is how we ended up with all these nut jobs running all these countries, clearly, is because we just abdic abdicated all responsibility. I mean, that's the only way that could have happened, right? Is if we just stopped really caring about who we elected, because whether we like it or not, as and all the jokes that we all, you know, is easy to make about fascism and all that stuff. Mm. Well, believe it or not, we actually do vote in our people, right? So if we got a bunch of, you know, if you don't like the people there, it's well, look in the mirror. Yeah. So mm. and and I don't like seeing that this happen and this be perpetuated in in the Golden Dawn community because what's the point in in claiming that we're practicing magic for spiritual development if we're if we're going to still behave poorly right like then 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 magic really ha should have nothing to do with spirituality like Stephen skinner says you know it should be completely separated either it should be taken seriously using magic for spirituality or i say separate the two altogether which isn't going to happen then which is why we just need to you know get a little bit of maturity and maybe mm hold people to slightly higher standards like don't pretend that you don't exist yeah. just i hear what you're saying brother yeah i hear what you're saying yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. so matt did you um <laughs> do you have uh do you have any other questions yeah, definitely. Uh, where did we leave off? We left off nice. of, uh, I guess, the importance of the death of the ego. Mm. I think that's where we left off, right? Oh, and yeah. And the, the, we were talking about the high genius. Yeah, the HGA and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess, uh, I guess, uh, have you guys ever tried psychedelics before? Do you mean psychedelics in the context of uh, Golden Dawn ritual work? No, I mean like LSD. DMT, Just to take LSD. Magic mushrooms. Yeah, like with I guess with intention, but yeah, have you guys ever tried? Oh that? yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I've never like like I've never really been interested in um in like tripping out when I'm doing Golden Dawn work. Uh I find that I find that like golden dawn work essentially trips me out plenty. Um, and so I don't really, and I don't really want to go beyond like where, where it's pushing me. Like, like I've golden dawn work has pushed, pushed me to mental limits before. Um, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm just not really interested in, 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 in trying to push beyond that using drugs uh but I, but anyway i i don't was that was that your question just just our relationship with psychedelics yeah i guess so i mean we talk about the death of the ego right and i think that psychedelics are a great way to quickly see what the death of the ego is like if you take enough mm. so if you take enough yeah. <laughs> if you take enough you can find out what the death of the ego is like and what the death of the body is like and Christ consciousness, <laughs> right? You could do both. I, 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 you're right. You're right. But I, I would say mainly psychedelics are pretty safe for you. You're not going to die. You may think you're going to die, but uh, magic mushrooms, LSD, if, uh, if you're with the right people, right sitters and right setting, I think it's 100% uh, safe. Definitely. In fact, I think in the future, within the next like five to 10 years, I could see... Uh, psychedelics being used accompanied by psychotherapy for people with ptsd um severe depression like i i think that uh you'll see a huge change in con like shift in perception just like well you're from canada um friday rc like you know 
cannabis 10 years ago very like looked down upon now you can buy it at any corner store i'm not saying it's going to be like that with psychedelics i think it's going to be uh more medicinal purposes um but uh yeah i know i was just interested in your guys take on that i'll tell you what interests me is the ayahuasca and all of that i mean i, I know somebody who um used to run ceremonies in Peru using ayahuasca. And she said that um, she got some really great results from that, you know, helping people. But it was done in a in the shamanistic context and, you know, yeah. in, in quite a, you know, in, in a way that was geared up to, to focus things on specific experiences. So um, I've never done that, but I, it, it would be something I'd consider, I think. The other thing I've heard a lot about recently is microdosing with, um, psilocybin and uh ayahuasca and uh, again i know somebody in california who does that and that that seems to work really well for her um and kind of has given her a new lease of life and a new perspective on herself so yeah i, I think it it has its place for sure uh, i don't know if it has its place in the golden dawn at all but i'm um, certainly in in other situations and some people need that to break them open in a way others don't in my viewpoint so um, I don't have anything against it. I just wonder how, how controlled it is. And as you say, if it's done in a kind of safe and proper way, um, it probably does help a great deal, you know. Definitely. I've been yeah, microdosing all week. I got this huge, huge mushroom like this big, and I just <laughs> take a tiny little piece off of it and I just eat it. And what, my theory of microdosing, like, well, when I microdose, I like to actually microdose. I'm not talking about small doses. The idea is that you can't tell, right? You don't yeah. notice the difference. That's like, it. Like if, point if, someone, two. if someone has taken a chunk of something or whatever it is that I guess you're doing and, and like, you know, and then getting a little slight trippy buzz all day, that's not really microdosing. Like that's a small dose. That's, that's definitely dosing because you're noticing a conscious difference. The idea of microdosing is it's having sort of an, an effect and you don't even notice it. And that is something you do notice. You notice that you don't mm. notice anything but feel slightly different all day. Um, and that's what you can take. And it doesn't matter how small the amount is, I've noticed. And it does make a difference. And it makes such a difference to functionality and creativity and work ethic that, that uh, like Silicon Valley, for example, has been doing this for ages to the extent that they now believe they, now believe they can say that companies that don't have their their employees microdosing on psilocybin are at a competitive disadvantage, and that's 100% the language. Agree. That's the language that really is powerful because the yeah. second you tell shareholders, "Hey, our company's at a competitive disadvantage," we know this mathematically because our staff aren't microdosing psilocybin. The second you can say that officially, that's when you'll see things change. The science is there, my friend. You're you're right. Like it's uh, it has an effect neuro neurogenesis, right? Yeah. So it's repairing of the brain tissue. Uh, you're you're actually like expanding the mind. You're expanding the consciousness. You're lighting up different areas of the brain that you weren't using before, right? Like science says we only use ten percent of the brain. Even if we were to use a, a fraction or a small percentage more, it could create significant results. So. Uh, I think microdosing is great, but I also do believe in macrodosing 100%. I don't know if you guys know about Terrence McKenna, but uh, five dry grams, silent darkness. Um, I think it's a great way to test your psyche. Um, and yeah, like it, I think it's a great way to uh, experience ego death as well. Like if you want to, but I think you were being funny before. I've seen what the afterlife is like, but when you said that, but I do believe that the effects of psilocybin uh, and DMT, uh, it's released actually when we're born and when we're de dying in the brain. So I do, as funny as what it sounds like, I think that you're right, actually. Like, uh, I think that um, these chemicals could have a similar effect as to like what death could be like. I'm not saying it's what death is, but it's, uh, I think it's uh, painting a picture. You're kind of breaking beyond the veil as I'm sure you guys can relate to that terminology. There's definitely something weird going on with our pineal gland. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. As far as, right. um, I mean, to answer your question, Matt, like, yeah. Um, 
um, I've done the macro dosing thing for sure. You asked about that specifically. And yeah. And yeah, like I, I've, I've believed I was dead for hours, many, many hours and was walking around thinking people couldn't see me and that I was <laughs> dead for hours and hours and hours after, after I took uh, about nine tabs of acid. Um, and that was really good. I was very suicidal before that. And, uh, because my best friend had killed herself and, uh, a lot of other things that ha sort of happened and I, I didn't really know what to do. And I talked to the counselor, the therapist I was seeing afterward and told him about the results of, of that nine dose trip where I, you know, basically I thought I was dead for a long period. Um, and it was just a ghost walking around, like <laughs> walking up and down the same stairs, like for two hours, you know? Because when I get to the top, I thought I had to, was supposed to go to the bottom. When I got to the bottom, I thought I was supposed to go to the top. And that's how I spent a couple hours that day. Um, and when I told them about the results, like all, any, any, all, everything was changed after the trip, right? Any, any, like, obviously I didn't really want to die, but having my friend kill herself in such a horrific way and, uh, and everything, all the fallout from that, like, I don't know how you can't be sort of damaged from it. Right. I'm not sure how I, how I could have not been damaged. So what do you do in that situation? How do you get out of that situation? Um, sometimes not all forms of spirituality are enough. Like, and, and sometimes people don't know what to say to you. And the therapist said something very interesting. He said, you know, it's a shame that, that uh, we can't recommend this in certain situations ever, because he said, you're exhibiting all the positive effects that we could hope for from such a, a treatment he said in fact you're exhibiting all the positive signs the most positive signs that you can expect from electroshock therapy he's like yeah. if, if electroshock therapy goes really well the person exhibits these sort of signs and you're exhibiting them all from you know macro dosing acid um and he said i'm so he's, he was very glad that i did that he was like i'm very glad he's like you're completely changed like and you know, I kept seeing him for many, many months just to make sure that I was sort of stabilized in that new space um, after that horrific experience. And uh, and it and it, it was good. It was good. Yeah, it totally worked. I have a lot of friends who were in uh, uh, really specialized service branches in the Canadian government. That's the probably the correct way to describe what they did. Um, you know, but these are people who like, you know, would get, were in Afghanistan shooting kids every day. Um, yep. and they would tell me about this and they'd be like, yeah, we, we had to really shoot kids all the time, um, because the kids had guns and were coming at us. Right. And it's like, oh shit. Well, most of us can't imagine that. Um, and, uh, you know, he, had, he, he used a lot of, he used a uh, microdosing MDMA to get off PTSD. And I know a lot of people have done that. Um, yep. when I heard that, uh, that's how I, I then dealt with that. And so, yeah, very effective there. Um, we yeah, the science is all coming out. Now there's different companies that are coming out and it's uh it's it's a serious thing. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm so glad that the medicine worked for you. I don't like to refer to it as a drug. I like to refer to psychedelics as medicines because I've seen so many different positive cases of people uh coming off opiate addictions, uh again, PTSD, severe depression, like um and these are no this is no joke. Like if you look at uh how how depressing like we were speaking at, at the beginning of the episode of how depressing uh, it's been not being able to go out and socialize and live a normal life. We have uh, multiple people, probably more than what you'd recognize in, in different states of depression. And, uh, and now more than ever, I think that we need these medicines. The, they've been proven to work and, uh, it, and they've been out for, I mean, much, magic mushrooms thousands of years. So, uh, and again, very safe. Um, yeah. it, if you know what you're doing, uh, and again, the setting is proper, your intention is pure. I think that uh, there's a reason why they're called magic mushrooms. Miracles can be worked with these things. Yeah, that's my own personal opinion. And uh, yeah, again, I think in the future these medicines are going to be legalized. And the MDMA, like again, oh, it just you're able to <laughs> open up, right? Like if it's. Uh, I mean, MDMA is kind of different. You have to be careful because it's a chemical compound. Like it's not an organic, like magic mushrooms, but uh, if you get it from a reputable source and uh, you have these great loving experiences, I think that uh, 
there's a lots of healing that can be done. And uh, yeah, I know it's a little bit of off Golden Dawn topic, but I mean, that's what magic is about, right? Healing the soul, killing the ego or. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, After the ego. So we, we actually have like, uh, there's actually like three mushroom dispensaries on my street here. Oh, really? Matt. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You have you tried the the penis envy oh big time I've, I've, man yeah. Yeah. I, I'd sent me on astral journey not even joking it like <laughs> it was almost it, i was tears of happiness were coming out of my eyes because of how how much love i felt <laughs> i felt like a little kid how i don't know how to describe it but i mean i've i've worked with magic mushrooms for a bit now and all i can say is all my journeys have been amazing the point about I find I think entheogens and mush and, and magic is that that you don't hear people talk about about a lot is even when you're just using hashish or something, yeah, it makes it a lot harder to focus. It's very hard to focus on the work you're doing, especially some of the very complex astral work we do in the Golden Dawn, which is a it's real stuff. Like I mean, if you're having to ascend from like, uh, you know, plane to plane, sphere to sphere. And in each plane, you're doing like a, you know, a whole middle pillar in that color and and then doing these other rituals all in that astral plane. That's a lot of stuff going on through your mind. And it takes a lot of focus to do it well and to also bring that energy through so that you experience it. Like this isn't all make-believe stuff. You're just visualizing and imagining like a lot of people these days seem to think it is. Um, I'm not sure how this stark divide between everything that we're capable of with our consciousness has occurred versus all the rest of like grimoire and evocational magic, which is now considered like real, like results-based magic. That's all real. And everything we do that involves imagination or the consciousness or our own natural energy is all new age make-believe. This is something recently that is quite popular to say. And I know this because people are saying to me all the time. And I think it's complete nonsense to create this stark divide. And I think it grew out of this uh, uh, fake um, dichotomy between the so-called psychological model and the spirit model, which I don't think is actually, I don't think it's actually real. I don't think, it, I, don't, I think it's, I think it's made up by people who are promoting uh, uh, artificial dichotomy so that they can make certain points about what well, they want to make, think... because I don't believe that anyone ever, I've never met anyone in my entire magical career that believes magic was all psychological and in your head. So who are these people that believe this? I think it's a straw man. Show me, show me this movement of people. I think since the, this dichotomy of a psychological model and spirit model has been promulgated in the, in the popular occult scene, since then, I think a lot of people have clung to the psychological model and gone to that and it's divided people but i i don't know of any i i think it's made up i've never encountered this in my life and i've you know i've been in this as long as most and at this point and so who are these people that are like magic only exists in our head and that's all that ever did and who are actual serious magical practitioners right that's what we're talking about otherwise it's not a model if it's just some randos on the street who thinks magic exists but only in your head I've never met these people and I've certainly never met a serious magical practitioner who has been like, Oh, I've experienced amazing things. I mean, it's all, it's all my own, my own make believe in my head, but I've experienced amazing things from magic. I've never heard someone say that either in the U S I mean, I know we lost John probably due to the, 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 he's, his, his battery ran out. So he's, he's charging his battery for oh, five okay. minutes. He'll, he'll I was back. wondering if we scared him off talking about no, no. plant medicine. Um, so, so I mean, one thing that I definitely notice with with magic a lot is that the context the context is highly experiential, right? So I mean it's 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 a very it can be a very subjective thing, right? You're the only one who you know when when especially when you're first starting out, and if you're a solo practitioner, you're the only one who knows that you did magic to, for example you know, get $30,000. So then when you end up with $30,000, you're literally the only person who knows like, like that there's a connection in the first place. If besides that you only used what you only know one magical system. So let's say that, you know, it's the, it's the 15th century and you only know about 
image magic as proposed by say Ficino and Picatrix, right? If that's the only thing that you know, then, you, then you're gonna have a very objective view of magic, right? You're gonna be like, okay, I have, to, I have to get these specific materials. I have to get this, I have to get this rock and this leaf and this incense and put them all together at the right time. And then $30,000 appears, right? Uh, when, when you do all of those things, like you might notice some, some inner work happening very vaguely, but for the most part, you have an objective view. Right. And so you when you when somebody like that meets a magician who is like, I don't do anything physically. I just go to sleep and then I have dreams. Mm. I wake up inside the dream. Then after that, I meet these creatures and I ask them to do a thing. And then the thing happens. That person has a very subjective view. Right. And they yeah. can get and they can argue all day about about how like you know about whether or not the worth of what they're doing is valid right but i mean but i think i think that that's where you know and and the thing is like like that's where results come in but also it's not where results come in because because it's like did they both obtain success doing what they're trying to do yes but we're talking about something that's tremendously subjective and sub tremendously indiv individual to begin with right so are are they are are they are they right i mean i i would say that they're both right are are, are their techniques valid i mean sure like like they both succeeded is there one way to do this nope well that's the thing see i just i i i totally agree and i just think they're just not separate things and i think that's a false dichotomy that we've created like we just made it up right like mm -hmm. like saying that americans are either red or blue what what that's bullshit that's 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 this is make-believe you're all human mm -hmm. beings oh no no you can't have human beings you can't have humanitarianism because then we'd all be one and see each other as sort of part of the same global cosmic organism and that's bad because you know that's just not what that's not what the forces of darkness want like the powers of Thaumiel uh, that are coterminous with Malkut are two opposing forces. That is the whole point of that Klepothic energy that, that shares the, the Malkut sphere with us uh, in theory. Um, so, so yeah, it's, 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 I think fruitless to, to think of magic as, as being divorced from the psychology. I mean, this is the great gift we did get from Rigardi is we got a psychologist who actually is a trained psychologist during the heyday of psychology. So like it was all really, you know, it was big stuff when he was studying psychology. Like, of course he became a psychologist. If you were alive during Freud, Jung, Reich, and all of these other cats, you'd probably become a psychologist as well. It was really cutting edge stuff. And he, uh, Rigardi explored these really amazing insights in how magic affects us psychologically and how it inter interrelates with the, our psychology. Um, but somehow that led to certain people saying that some people only believe magic is in your head and psychologically uh, driven. And again, I don't think I don't think that, that that's real. I don't think people, I never met people in the 90s, even in the new age 90s, I never met anyone who thought that way, right? Everyone thought magic affects your psychology. You use your consciousness and your, your mind to interact with a lot of things, especially spiritual creatures. Um, and that's just sort of the, the starting point, right? When, 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 you, when you get spiritual creatures to show up through evocation and invocation and, and they start interacting with you, I never met anyone who was like, it's in my head, I'm visualizing it. And because, because you, how would that happen? Like even in my, when I was 13 in our Wiccan coven, like we were like, I'm visualizing a, a, a spirit over there. Do you guys all see it? It's like, what are you talking about? We see the spirit that's there. We can see it with our eyes. It's not in your head. What are you talking about? No one would say that. So who are these people? I think they're fictitious. I think they were made up to cause division artificially within the occult community. 
Well, I mean, from what it sounds like, it's just, it just sounds like somebody read somebody read a lot of Riccardi, never really thought it through, and never really tried to go anywhere with it. Yeah, never you certainly I mean? never practiced the Z formula evocation. Jesus. Yeah. Like you know, yeah. spirits will show up, and if you can't see them, take some mushrooms. Then you'll see them. Because <laughs> seriously, around, the, the thing I've noticed most, especially if you're outside of a city in nature, when you take you, not even that necessarily a high dose of mushrooms, um, is the spirits are visible. So the great breakthroughs I've had in the last couple of years using mushrooms with ritual work have been phenomenal because the things I've seen with my eyes open, no astral sight needed as I'm working, like especially after the circumambulations, the the these the wisps of the spirits, like the the strands of the spirits, get pulled and they circle around the altar and they move into the altar and they want to go into the crystals or the scrying bowl or whatever's there. You know, they're all getting pulled in. And I even tested out the theory of the Earth Pentacle, which you you know there was this old theory that if you unveiled your Earth Pentacle uh, around actual tan you know tangible spirits that were present. They, they would all get banished because it's so grounding it would ground them out and banish them and and that that would protect you if you needed it to like some other solomonic devices are intended to do but when i tried that out it didn't work and they all actually started swarming towards the earth pentacle and so i asked the spirits <laughs> yeah. why are you swarming towards the earth pentacles and they said we like the shapes and the colors mm. they said you know what like the it, shapes it, and the colors and i was like this is crazy yeah, that, it, that goes sense. that goes it goes back to this. Um, it goes back to we, we were talking about colors before. Um, and I noticed something the other day that the adept oath in the adept oath, it specifically says, like, like so it's it's the part where you're talking about what exactly you're gonna keep secret. And it's, it's I, I forget like all the things that all the things it says that you're gonna keep secret, but then it says especially knowledge of flashing colors it calls out flashing colors specifically yeah. um and then and then like like john john chacks when he was on before he was talking about how um or i think it was john it, we were talking about how the uh you know the the floor is all black and white and then you usually have like black walls around you but then the vault itself and and the tablets it's like it's just everything pops with like all this color um and he just made me think about how like we because th this was part of the meta discussion before like what is it to even be an adept and i i'm starting to think that a major part of being an adept is understanding the magic of color Definitely. 100%. It's all, it's all relative, right? Like color is vibration itself. So it's, mm -hmm. I think that color relates to the octaves of music. Like it, it relates to music, the human body, just like the tree of life relates to the human body as well. Like it all correlates with each other, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a part of being a golden dawn adept, though it's not part of, I think, all traditions right it's it's really not it's it's pretty unique really to the golden dawn is the the color theory um so i'm not sure no. if it if it's distinctive of adepthood it's just distinctive of golden dawn adepthood of well, the right exactly grade yeah. we, i think we should distinguish between I, I do like it when people distinguish between you know grade titles like adeptus and and sort of general uses of these titles because it, it can be helpful to understand that what we're describing is not necessarily oh, yeah. um what a lot of people think it is it's not like we're talking about um some sort of ontological change that makes one person superior to other people and that's how a lot of people see that and that's a problem i think right like i, I that that would be like that would be one of the most that would be like the most anti-Jesus, anti sort of Christian, and people might be surprised me saying that, but you, know, you, you can't take Jesus out of the golden dawn, especially the inner order initiations. Um, I mean, it's sort of baked in um, along with all, you know, Osiris and all these other God forms and beings. And to, so therefore it's such an anti-Christian sentiment, the idea that, your closeness to God would somehow make you um, different in kind to other people is the exact opposite message Jesus was trying to impart to humanity. 
in his sort of egalitarian quest of of loving each other and and uh, you know being saved through through community, which was which is what early Jesus was very much about. Per, it was communal salvation. Early Christians were very were, were completely antithetically opposed to the idea of personal salvation or the idea of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That was that didn't exist. That was that was something that got made up later on. Um, this idea of a personal relationship with Christ, not a part of the early Christian tradition whatsoever. In fact, the opposite is true. It's the idea that together in community, we become saved through, you know, participation in, in these rituals, which is primarily the Eucharist. And uh, yeah, so I think that's an interesting, interesting thing to, worth remembering mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when we talk about adepthood. John just got back to us and he said that he said that he's not going to be able to make it back on. Ah, we shouldn't have talked about entheogens. <laughs> just, well, that was my bad. We lose this. <laughs> we lose the Brits on that one. Shit. Well, we can, we can always we can always try to do it again, right? <clears throat> I mean, we well, we I think I think this is like time number three that we've that we've tried to organize this. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So it's a, uh, it's, we're, we're sort of Frankensteining it together. So, so we're, we're like, we're, oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to throw. No, no, I was just going to ask Matt, do you feel like, do you feel like we've, uh, we, we've addressed what you were curious about? Oh, hundred percent. I wish okay, we had recorded awesome. that the other, the other half that wasn't recording. No, and it was just <laughs> me and like John, like that. We had some, I think that we had some great conversations, some good topics and like, Yes, yeah. I could bring it up again, but uh, we could save it for another time, maybe, or I don't know, because, like, it's just, uh, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. But uh, I was going to say, uh, uh, we we're talking about uh, color and vibration, and uh, I just wanted to bring up the tarot. And uh, so, do you think that, I guess, like, uh, let's say, well, obviously, the tarot is like a very special magical tool, and the trumps are, uh, the major arcana uh, i was just wondering if let's say someone uh, is uninitiated and they just start looking at the, the images itself do you think that it could produce some magical effect just because the color the vibration the the symbolism on the card like i think that alistair crowley said that the the tarot the cards themselves are living beings right so do you think that even just picking up a a tarot deck being uninitiated could create some magical effect within the mind. I think for it to be a magical effect, you need training and in and tension and practice because magic yeah. isn't isn't as loose as like Alistair Crowley would have us believe in his definition. Yeah. Um, it has a lot more to do with leveraging, uh, you know, spirits or your spirit. So there has to be that that trained leveraging for it to be, you know, magic. Um, otherwise, gotcha. lots of things can occur. I think. I mean, strong psychics, you know, they they go into trances or have visions when they, you know, pick up the most random things sometimes, like psychometrically, or you know, with tarot cards and the colors and have visions or going go on little trips. I mean, Yates would just walk around with his tatwas in his pocket, and you know, every time someone had him over for tea, he would pull out a tatwa and see how many people in the household he could get into a shared path working vision. Um, he would, this was, you know, it wasn't exactly a party trick, but it was, he really believed that, that something was going on with the way in which our minds merge together and, and have these sort of shared experiences. And, and so, yeah, he was, uh, he was really into seeing just what happened when, the average unsuspecting uh, peasant in in the Irish countryside, where he would travel around collecting stories, would what they'd experience when he'd pull out tatwas and, and go on these little journeys. I mean, we only have a few notes of his like mentioning these sort of things, but people, other people, wrote in their letters and 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 journals like uh, slight references to it. That's why we know he did it quite a bit, um, you know. So it's very interesting. Very cool. So I think spontaneous things can occur for sure, of course, from, you know, depending on someone's sensitivity, uh, otherwise you need sort of an operational uh, thing to set it up to cause it to happen or to lead someone who's controlled into that experience. 
Um, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's important to understand that um, it's important to understand that we're not entirely in charge of our, of, of what, we're not entirely in charge of what I'll call a spiritual experience, right? So, you know, if, you know, I think a lot about, so my, my, my wife is very much, is very much involved in meditation, right? And I'll see her, I'll see her just perform like a simple meditation and visualization. And it's like, you know, it's as if a magus did this work, like, like I'll see her do stuff and then like everything changes. And it's like this masterful, um, it's this masterful technique that I see coming out of her. And she didn't have to, she just did a simple meditation. <laughs> if I did that simple meditation, I, I don't expect that I would get much of anywhere with it. Um, I've done meditations like that before. And it, you know, I've done meditations like, like that before. And I've seen, I've seen an effect over say 10 years, very subtle, not like, not like her, um, not like her, like explosive experiences. Um, and so just watching, watching her work has taught me a lot about, about how, like, like some people have gifts that, that, uh, and, and, and we're not in charge of who gets, who gets those gifts, you know? So yeah, to, to answer your question, it's like if somebody is just naturally inclined towards working with colors, for example, and and they come along and they come along a brilliantly colored tarot deck, then sure, yeah, I would think that uh, I would think that there is something to be said for personal gifts. It's it's interesting that in the Golden Dawn, and people I think forget this and get confused about this. At least that's what I see when I see people talking about it. Um, especially when they they change the colors or they mute the colors of the tools or, or or mess around with that sort of stuff, they they think that we use the colors like uh, uh, to represent the elements, right? For example, with the elemental tools, they think we use these colors because they represent the elements, and then of course the flashing form causes the uh, the trippy effect that we all enjoy so much who have worked with these things properly. Um, and and help you you know access access that force but this is a mistake because if that was true you can make it any color you want and call it whatever you want you can just make it up you can just say you know pink is 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 earth and turquoise is fire and you know that's my color correspondence is that's my set but that's not what the golden dawn believes they believe that colors don't represent forces they believe that colors are forces <clears throat> so as soon as you change the color and say you don't like the, the bright colors of the elemental weapons in the Golden Dawn, so you change them. Okay, so no, they are no longer Golden Dawn tools. They no longer represent the forces that all the other Golden Dawn tools represent. When you change the color, you change the colors on the rainbow or lotus wand, then they're no longer the zodiacal colors or the forces. They don't, it's not that you've used different colors to represent the zodiac. You're no longer using the zodiacal forces because you're not using the colors that are those forces. And I think it's quite, po it's very funny how similar, like it seems like they just sort of took this idea from Rudolf Steiner, but, but uh, I think Steiner, I think they, they weren't familiar with Steiner in 1888 when they started uh, putting out writings to these effects and developing this understanding. I don't think they were very familiar. I don't think they were familiar with Steiner's work at all in those days. So it looks like they developed along parallel lines. Interesting. Yeah. I'm curious. And I have what... a question for you. Uh, what uh, do you want to go to philosophers? Definitely. Uh, do you do you see that happening in the next? When do you see that happening, or or do you see it happening? I mean, I guess I guess my bigger question is like like, do you manage that part of your path very much, or are you just more like oh, I'm a practicus right now? When I'm ready to be philosopher, that's when it will happen. I'm at the point right now where I've pretty much memorized all the material for it. I just need to take the test. Mm -hmm. So it's just about 
just setting it up, I guess. Like, because uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm pretty much ready for it. I just, mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I'm pretty much ready for it. Within do the you, next six you, months. Do you know other Philosophy? Yeah, yeah. You do? Okay. Um, what What do you think of their journey? Like, what do you think of their um, of their experience of philosophers? Actually, like, you know what? I, I guess, like, um, I'm not really in contact with anyone at the moment that's in mm-hmm. philosophers. Like, I, I'm not in the order at the moment, so I can't really answer that question. Oh, to be yeah, with yeah. You. And then I guess, I guess my other question is like, what do you think about how's your, how's your journey been so far? Definitely an interesting one. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Even like I was saying, just even getting into the golden dawn, um, like searching through the occult knowledge through the Freemasons and then just kind of speaking about some esoteric things and, and then kind of being pulled aside and saying like, look, like this may be an opportunity for you uh like Mm -hmm. like we were discussing before it was very synchronistic Mm -hmm. so i feel like my journey has been uh a magical one to say the least uh very Mm -hmm. like things lining up at just different moments of time have really worked out for me um the experience of going through the initiations has been an amazing and and meeting um different people on on the same path like you were discussing before it's it's all about community and like even though I'm not an adept, I still have, uh, have you guys to reach out to. And, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's awesome. You know what I mean? Like, cause obviously soon I would like to start doing, uh, like Enochian work and Solomonic magic, but, uh, I'm just kind of sticking with the elemental rituals right now, like the basics, like middle pillar, banishing, invoking, uh, the el- and the elements but uh nothing too too significant but uh I, it's a journey right it takes time so mm-hmm. just go step by step but uh mm-hmm. i'm excited it, i'm excited for the next path or the next part and Why, just what you said what, what happened just to your from, order sorry I'm, I'm i'm a little confused that you you asked him if he's in uh, about going to philosophers and Matt, you're like you said you're not in an order in the order right now. What happened? Uh, no, the- no, I was in the the Toronto order, the Hermetic order of the Golden Dawn, the Cicero one, and uh, everything is great with it. I just decided, like, I was kind of just busy with work at the time, um, and I was doing a lot of Masonic work as well, like going through the chairs. So I decided to take a break from the Golden Dawn. Like I was doing the work, but I just wasn't really attending uh, the meetings, and then I just kind of fell out of it to be honest and then uh now i'm i'm really practicing and ready for the next step so i'll get back into it soon very cool so yeah so the temple the 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 cicero's temple in toronto is still there yeah i'm pretty sure you just you just had to pull away pull back for a while Uh, yeah yeah, Yeah. cool do my own thing yeah yeah it's great that they got one going on there i'm glad to hear that yeah for sure. No, there's a, there's a few different temples in Ontario, I think. Like, not only the Cicero's, but I know of a, someone else that's now doing their own thing. So, it's, uh, yeah, definitely got some practice. Sorry, sorry for the there. detour on there, Joseph. Oh, yeah, no, no yeah, problem no, I just wanted to clarify so I could understand where things are at. You want to just keep going for a minute? I just got to run to the to the, the loo. Sure. Be right okay. back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess, I guess it, so it sounds like, it sounds like your interest, like your long-term interest is a practical one. Um, I, I say that because you're talking about inocuum work and Solomonic work. And usually those, usually those are means to an end. Um, the end, the end being, you know, changing your life in some way or changing someone else's life and so on, changing life, I should say. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so It's interesting because with the Golden Dawn, you can take many different approaches to it. Um, And a lot of people take, I remember, I I remember, you know, uh, 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, people were uh, very much, people were very much into what they called spiritual development, right? Where the, uh, the practical aspects of the work weren't just, they, they, they weren't seen as important as uh, as actually 
you know, as, as ascension, right? So like there was this idea of, of spiritual ascension and that spiritual ascension was primary. And then sure, occasionally, if, if the shower breaks, then we can fix it with magic or something. But, but the important part is, is the spiritual ascension. Um, so, so some people take that approach and then other people take a very practical approach. Um, you know, where the, where, where the idea, you know, where their attitude is, well, what I'm after is truth, right? I'm not, I can do much more with a little tiny piece of truth than I can with a whole tower of spiritual ascension that doesn't have a lot of truth in it, right? And so the way that they go towards truth is through practical work where they'll say, you know, okay, you've given me, you've given me these, that you give me a way to divine through tarot. You give me a way to work paths. How do I then do something with that? Um, and a lot of people wait until Adeptus Minor to start to begin that work of answering, of answering that, right? But you don't have to do it that way. If you want to, you can pursue practical work just as a, I mean, and, and this isn't entirely for me to call because, because I, I'm not in your order. Um, and moreover, this is entirely your journey. So it's, it's not up to me. Um, but I just wanted to bring up that, that like your questions so far have been practical questions. Um, I'm very much of, I'm very much, you probably guess this already, but I, I'm very much of a practical mindset. Um, and so just with what you have now, you can start to explore truths by, by doing practical work, by, by causing, you know, um, um, by attempting to make changes in your life. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Maybe you knew that already. You probably did. No, I, oh, I have, like, I did, yeah, hundred percent. But it's good to have that reassurance. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For sure, mm -hmm. for sure. But um, uh, let's see what other questions I have for you guys here. Yeah. So, you guy, I'm the last one standing. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Yeah, that's hilarious. What time do we have on here? How long has this been going on for? Uh, we've been going since around one. So now it's three thirty. That's my time. So yeah, yeah. You know what? I'm gonna I might uh call it in just like a few minutes here, just because I do have to get a few things done today. Um, okay. But one second here. Oh, I was gonna bring up uh okay, you might you, you you might be able to help me out with this because again I'm learning the tarot, it's three equals eight, right? Um what deck would you start out with? I have the Foth deck and I also have the rider weight deck. I love the symbolism and the thoth, but then also too, it gets me tripped up because of the difference between Zadi being not the Zadi being the star or not mm -hmm. being the star. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, Zadi not being the star. I'm just wondering, like, what would you go with? Is it like, cause I, I mean, obviously Zadi is the star in the golden dawn. I'm not sure. And again, I'm not really there why it would make a difference or not. So what would you go with? Is it cool to just go with the right or weight or would you go with the, with the Thoth deck? What was your recommendation? My answer is going to be blasphemical to the 90s. My answer is going to be uh, use the rider weight deck. Use the, okay. use the rider weight deck. But moreover, get the book, The Pictorial Key to the Tarot by A.E. Weight, right? Okay. And then... And then what you want to do is, so you'll have your Rider Waite deck, right? And then you'll have the pictorial key to the tarot. What you're going to do is read through, read through the pictorial key to just, you don't have to do this, I, but I'm putting this out there as an experiment because I did this and it was tremendously successful. Yeah. Get the pictorial key to the tarot and then just straight up memorize all of the meanings that are given in AE Weight. You're going to get like, you're going to get like 15 different meanings for a card sometimes. And you're going to get like two different meanings for a card for another card, like other times, right? Just memorize everything, memorize all of it. Take absolutely no prisoners 
and just learn the pictorial key to the tarot, right? So, okay, so once you have that in your head, right, then just perform the, the pictorial key gives like the tarot reading, like, like the easiest tarot reading in the world is, is at, I think it's the Celtic cross spread is at the end of pictorial key. Once you have all that knowledge that weight puts in the book, use weights description of, of a tarot reading and see what your tarot is like. Okay. Okay. I'll give That's, it a go for sure. Well, I mean, like if you really give it a go, it's going to take you yep. a long time. Cause you're going to have to memorize like tons of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But if, if you do it and then, and then try a reading with it, just, I, I'd be curious to see what happens. All right, cool. It's an experiment. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, to, to answer your question, like I, so I did the same thing as you, I had, I had the Thoth deck at first and then I had, and then it was like, and I had that thing for like years. Right. And then I got the Rider Waite deck. Um, and I would, you know, first off, I would say that Rider Waite is probably closer to Golden Dawn style symbolism. Um, but moreover, uh, moreover, there's really cool stuff that you can do with the Rider Waite deck. Okay. I'm cool. listening to the Roger Parasus lecture on the Rider Waite deck, um, which is on, um, um, is it Adam McLean's YouTube page? Um, he, he posted, uh, at the beginning of COVID, right before COVID, January, right before that, he posted all the recordings of the lectures he had from the Golden Dawn Conference in London in, I think it was like 94 or something, or uh, it, was a, it was a while back. It was, it was a while what's, back. What's the video called on YouTube? <clears throat> well, I actually have it. I have it on, if you go to Frater RC YouTube page, I have it on a special playlist so that it can be easily found. And Roger Parasus was the secretary. Oh, first off, greetings from the astral plane. Woo! <laughs> Is that great? Yeah, greetings from awesome. the astral plane. <laughs> <sighs> I didn't wear the shirt that has an inverted pentagram with Bill Gates's head on the front. I'll save that <laughs> for the next time. We're missing out. <laughs> hey, just turn on the news if you want some more Satanism and demonism and, <laughs> and hopelessness. It's all over the media. So we got plenty of it there. I thought we'd anyway. Um, where what was the question? Oh, we were just talking about oh, so he oh, asked he yeah. asked where what yeah. the web page was. But moreover, the original question was he was like, I'm trying to work on uh, I'm trying to work on memorizing the tarot. Uh, I have the Thoth deck and the Rider Waite deck. Which deck should I use? The Rider Waite. I mean, it, what's fascinating is what's revealed in that lecture. And I think the lecture is actually from the '80s. I think that these lectures are from a Golden Dawn conference in the '80s. Like Bob Gilbert was there, and and Roger Parasus was not only the arch uh, the archivist. He was the archivist and secretary for the Theosophical Society in Ireland, and I believe he was also in charge of the yates archives for the yates family at the wow, time cool. so so he really knows what he's talking about and the and these lectures only just got released you know january 2019 and people still and i i, I talked i messaged I, I chatted briefly with tabby about what he says in that lecture about the right of weight because i read her paper from a, a golden Dawn conference either that year or a few years later and you know she she she, she notices the same things that we all notice that it looks like the Rider Waite deck is based on the Wolfram von Eschenbach Parsifal Grail legend. Mm. But that doesn't take into account why the tools on the magician card are the Celtic gems of the four county, the four uh, uh, areas of Ireland. Well, they are. I never yeah. knew that. Yeah. They're the, they're like, you got the cauldron, right? There's a cauldron, I think, and a stone mm -hmm. and a staff or a spear mm. so they have the irish magical tools on the rider weight deck and what what roger parasus's research showed is that apparently there's a whole narrative system set up that you can see if you display the cards a certain way like you know so i got a little deck to, to once i have more wall space i'm going to lay them out and see what sort of things i can figure out <clears throat> he just touches on a bunch of things that no one really has explored since, mainly probably because if you weren't at the lecture live and no papers were produced, uh, then no one's know. heard it until just the other year. And 
So I mentioned it to Tabby. I'm like, have you, have you taken a look at this? Like, we should really look at this because what it shows is that it wasn't based on the Wolfram von Eschenbach Parsifal Grail story. It was based on a Welsh Grail story. And, and this mm -hmm. came from Yates. Yates gave this, the, the, the directions for all of it to, <clears throat> to uh, his fellow Gould Donners, uh, Waite and Pamela Coleman Smith. And, and he just didn't have time to do a tarot deck. He was very, very busy being one of the most famous writers in the world, you know? Um, sorry, Crowley. And really, therefore, the deck should be called like the Coleman Yates deck. Mm. It really should be. It really, really should mm. be. But, you know, it had to be Rider Waite. Couldn't have a... <clears throat> couldn't have a woman's name on a tarot deck back then. <laughs> that would be like witchcraft, right? It would be exactly witchcraft. like witchcraft back yeah. then, yeah. Yeah. If it's a if it's a bunch of Freemasons, then it's respectable, very respectable. <laughs> <clears throat> For memorizing the symbolism, Matt, I really enjoyed throughout my Golden Dawn experience using the uh, Regardi Wang deck because the images were so clear and simplified, so they they really stuck out. And they were done in a in a nice way that I sort of liked uh, that resonated with me. But yeah, the images, having stark, clear, comprehensible images that your mind can can cling on to easily, I find very useful. I also consider the the tarot contemplation ritual to be like one of the most misunderestimated rituals out there and practices. I think a lot of people uh, um, neglect it to their their woe. Well, maybe not their woe because they never know what they're missing, but. That's how a lot of magic is. You don't really know what you're missing until you really put in the effort. I mean, this is what the, the grimoirists today are telling us, like Ash and Shasan and all these people are like, hey, yo, if you do all these things right, you can actually get a little bit more than we've been getting from it, like maybe a lot more. And so that's great to hear. It's like, oh, oh cool. Well, let's, let's all try, uh, you know, Solomonic magic with uh, <clears throat> that in mind, then. you know, because for a long time that was not really taken very seriously and practiced to uh to the letter and uh it's nice that people are now saying hey you know th these things can these this the system can be pushed these systems can be pushed a bit further they can achieve more than that mm -hmm. they are currently mm -hmm. achieved but you won't know unless you do that which right. is why like when I, i'm doing a, a lot of purism uh, purist enochian these days right and <clears throat> having all the right tools like if you don't do it with all the right tools made all the right way out of sweet wood and stuff, then you won't know what you can get from having that. It's just that simple. So I think it's worth, it's worth it. Is there a purist golden dawn? <clears throat> um, I, I would say uh, there certainly is. I mean, there's 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 orders that are, I would call, purist like uh, Sam Scarborough and uh, the uh, not not that it's his order as he's made very clear to me, um, <laughs> um, they uh, for example I believe they really only have they follow the exact curriculum as the old order more or less so, you get the, the banishing and the invoking pentagram ritual and then the meditations. And I believe that's it for the entire order order. Man, I don't know if I would have stuck with the golden dawn if I had joined a order that was like, you know, everything you've learned in all the occult books for the last five years. And I'd be like, yeah, they're like, you can't do any of it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And all the, you know, the hour of ritual work you're doing every day. Yeah. You can do the don't first do that. ritual. That's it. And, and breathing. <laughs> can I meditate? Okay. You can meditate. How long do I have to do this for? Like years, years. Well, would you have to do it for years though? Didn't we talk about this before that like the original, in the original Golden Dawn, it was like you're in the outer order for a year. Yeah, like year, year and a half, maybe two years, yeah. um, depending mm -hmm. on things. Yeah. <clears throat> but the official I <coughs> what the regimen is, isn't it something like, like the symbolic regimen? I think they say it in five, six. It's like, it's something like seven months as a philosophist, nine months as a portal. Yeah, but yeah, so that came along later. I mean, the seven mm -hmm. months as philosophist is definitely a very later uh, edition, definitely. Um, they, they had a, they, they often would, uh, you know, ask for three months in, in practice and stuff, but 
portal portal like i mean portal was when it was first created it was um it was filling in a stop gap that they needed uh but for all the because they had all these nominal adepti they had all these nominal five six people who had passed their philosophers exams and but they had didn't have time to get the initiation yet and the initiation made you know didn't actually even exist right away so they were just nominal five six adepti mm-hmm. and they had to like do all kinds of shenanigans to like sort of separate them from the real five six and they needed something to fill that space and then the portal came along and, and did that um the uh, you know gave them that thing and then they came up with a nine month thing after the fact um which is funny because you know it's funny how well a traditionalist will very very much cling to these traditions and like they are sacrosanct without really acknowledging that they occurred in a time and a place and for a reason mm-hmm. you know so and if you keep going back to their the purest truest form of this tradition well all you get is is three guys you know, talking about starting an order so it's the well, pure, right. pure yeah. golden if dawn you re- if you, if you, you really want to be like, golden dawn become a right. mason find two friends and talk about starting a golden dawn exactly that's, that's what the a purest, purest state. would be that was yeah. it. join the sria the and Essentia. then and then find somebody creative to write an initiation ritual congratulations you have discovered the pure golden and then dawn someone's dawn. like oh really well we do we do pentagram rituals in our golden dawn it's like oh well you're a you're a later innovator you represent that tradition <laughs> once they started doing initiations and rituals and stuff like that we're part of the true the ur golden <laughs> right. dawn that predates all the rituals and all of that sort of spiritual practices and meditation nonsense right so who created the the lbrp it developed what a great it developed there's rumors that they learned it from alephis levy of course and uh can you break down the psychology of it like obviously like uh you're using the four cardinal directions the four archangels and and uh four holy names but uh like what is the psychology i mean obviously it can be used for different things right like banishing and invoking the different elements but uh like why do we uh use the holy names before the archangels <coughs> and uh i mean yeah that's yeah from, I'm, that's because it you always start invoking from the highest in the golden dawn tradition oh, okay you'll, okay, you'll okay, see okay, goetic okay. people argue about this all the time they're like which name should we do should we do first and and some people will say like you should do the higher names first and they'll be like no that's a golden dawn thing we should invoke the lowest names first and whatever you'll hear people debate that definitely in the golden dawn we, we invoke from the highest first which is why you have the divine names in each of the four quarters and then you have the archangels afterwards that would make sense but again <clears throat> the ritual developed and didn't start at that point it started as them just like you would just do a pentagram and in you would as you were drawing the pentagram you'd project into it everything you wanted to get rid of if you're banishing right and then you would use the divine name and and, and project into it actually before the sign of the entry you just stab into it and you would use the divine name to get rid of everything that you wanted to get rid of that you had projected into that pentagram that was like the sort of proto under, understanding of the lbrp as far as i as far as i have read um is how it started and then it developed out of there but it was never it was never used elementally to have anything to do with the four elements in the four quarters that was never a part of the lbrp or lirp at all um and the archangels were originally just vi- vi- visualized as columns of white light they were net, mm. they had no images or color association whatsoever and it, the and the lbrp wasn't lirp wasn't seen uh as a having anything to do with the elements just invoking god and spirit into your sphere and setting it as a you know as in its places around the four quarters to protect you and all of these things whether you're invoking or banishing if the lbrp and lirp are equally protective whether you're invoking or banishing um so it was you know if you were doing an operation that you wanted to gain something or uh, like an invocation you would start your rituals with an lirp if you wanted to do a ritual to get rid of something you would start your your ritual work with an lbrp yeah yeah um so that's uh, interesting i think oh definitely um so with the the flashing colors of the archangels um and i guess uh, what I was going to say is you're envisioning the archangels, you're envisioning the flashing colors. Um, 
and we are discussing how magic obvious like if there's real there's results to be had evocation there's going to be spirits however the lbrp you're imagining the archangels uh has there ever been a time where um the imagination becomes so real so vivid that it almost you like you feel the presence of the archangels oh for sure for sure yeah well you see the like idea almost beyond the imagination of course because when yeah. you whenever you create a god form <clears throat> this core golden dawn magical theory is whenever you create a yeah. god form or an egregore the the purpose like you're you may be creating it microcosmically or just within yourself if that kind of thinking is helpful to to use at all it may not be um especially it, it didn't exist in the grimoire times and they just saw you know spirit is doing this within spirit if it's helpful to think of it as a micro macro then so be it <clears throat> but if you're creating something an egregore is a representational force you're sympathetically drawing the the force it represents to it so the more strong that you create these egregores of archangels and call the archangels to you the more they are attracting the actual nascent source of what they're representing themselves and you create you create this drawing effect um so you do interact more and more with the actual some sort of representation of the spirit itself right archangels are just so different from chthonic or or very or enochian spirits right they're very very different and they're, mm -hmm. they're good for general things and general answers and 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 uh but they're not necessarily the most uh physically manifest beings right off the bat unless you're going to do a full evocation and, and all of that gotcha yeah think, I... uh uh, the, the, I guess I guess like the only the only thing that that I wanted to say was uh, for the LBRP, um, it goes back to what you what we were talking about before. Yeah. Uh, remember remember when remember when um, John Shax was on before, uh, and he was talking Frater about Mercurio. Frater Mercurio was was on before, and he was talking about how. Um, um, he was talking about how your how the invocation of the higher genius itself is to to do that right like 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 if you if you want to have something to do then what all the ruach is doing is it's it's essentially the job of a janitor right where where you're you're keeping everything clean you're keeping everything you're keeping everything organized uh, you're managing everything, but uh, but ultimately the job of that ruach is passive, right? And it's passive so that the spirit can descend, right? When you're doing these LBRPs over, you know, so so like when you're when you're in the when you're in the outer and you're going through these elemental grades, you're doing the LBRP like all the time, right? That is that work of of clearing everything out, right? And then. Besides that, think just just think for a second about what it is exactly that's happening, right? You're going through these elemental grades and you're performing the less the LBRP in each of these elemental grades. So you're being initiated into these elemental grades, and then you're performing the LBRP over and over and over and over again, right? You're getting this deep clean of each of these elements, right? So that by the time that you hit the end, you will have deep cleaned all of the elements. Right, so that then during portal you can start to bring in, you can start to bring in the spirit. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I don't even remember the question. It's just as as RC was talking about stuff, I was like, I want to say something about about the outer order, and so th there it is. Yeah, I could feel it, brother. That's why I threw it, threw it to you. Um, let's clarify for the listeners also. When you say LBRP, uh, it's all you, you mean also LIRP, of course. It's just common to say LBRP, but obviously you're doing LIRPs as well. Oh, sure, yeah, every day. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not. It's it's that's one thing that <clears throat> is a is a sort of a sticking point in the community right now. I think as as you both both probably noticed is. Because it's in common parlance since Regardi to 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 talk about it as the LBRP, magicians you generally refer to the LBR it, as a lot of magicians say LBRP even when they're talking about the invoking form, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and that can throw a lot of people off and think that you're only doing the LBRP, but of course you're doing the LIRP. Like obviously. it depends on. Uh, I remember 
<laughs> I remember this actually came up during my uh, during my outer order work. And I remember my proctor at the time was like, well, during elemental grades, you really want to do the LIRP of whatever element it is you're working with at the time. That was an innovation by our order, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. yeah. We invented the, we, that, that's complete, that, that's our, that was completely our own thing. So that's all no us. The Cicero's order would ever know what you're talking about with, with mm -hmm. uh, doing, changing the LIRP to a different direction. Um, mm -hmm. They look at that quite, uh, they look at it askance. Yeah, I think it's actually the most one of the most brilliant things that came out of out of out of our order. I think it's brilliant. Um, of what an amazing innovation! Um, is it different? Yes, it's not the same thing as the normal LIRP. Of course not, and it can't. When you, when you change a ritual, you you don't create a different version of that ritual. You create a new ritual, right? Like the greater ritual of of the pentagram and hexagram that Crowley created isn't a version of the supreme ritual of the pentagram and hexagram it's sure a ritual mm -hmm. and that's what happens when you change rituals they become new rituals so we uh, we would we would invoke uh, try and invoke the element of the grade that you're in through through the pentagrams and it seemed to work everyone found it worked thousands of people yeah. for decades found it incredibly effective so for all the people mm -hmm. who say you can't do that and it's wrong and it's not golden dawn, well, yeah, it's new. It's made up just like all the other stuff as the tradition has grown, was invented and tested and tried. And that has a great sample set. If you want to talk about sample sets, magicians want to talk about results-based magic, you have thousands of people trying this throughout all the grades for decades and worked pretty damn well. <clears throat> so for all those naysayers out there then again but do, do i think everyone should be doing that no you don't i don't think it's necessary just the basic lirp for you know summoning spirit into your sphere is great nothing wrong with being in the elemental grades and bringing in spirit every day like that that makes sense and then it gets it's filling up you're you're already you already have the spirits and the beings of the watchtowers charged and set to the task of doing magical effects within your your being with like the, they're tasked with transforming you and purifying you and challenging you in ways that makes you grow and develop and become more than human, I guess. And, uh, but the purification I think is a big part of it as that elemental energy is infused through the, through the connection with the watchtower and regulated through the in, initiation ceremony itself to function a certain way. It brings out parts of our ego, right? It brings out parts of our Ruach <clears throat> and emphasizes them the good and the bad. And so you have to learn to balance those things as each of them come up. <clears throat> and in that process, Frater Yakita has an interesting point I was reading the other day on, in his, one of his Enochian books about how it's a really great way to slowly build up what, the, what your container of, of yourself is capable of holding energetically so that by the time you get to Enochian and stuff like that, your body is more capable of handling the amount of energy that, that is being dumped into you without you know, losing your shit and burning out or whatever hey uh we're at we're right at the end i guess because mm -hmm. are we i don't know it's mm -hmm. been a weird one <laughs> yeah it's been it's been a weird one we've bounced two different places there was a there was a long gap where where uh great things were said and I think, uh, I think Matt, I, I mean, obviously Matt taught us because, because Matt is secretly the greatest one among us, but he doesn't know it yet. So <laughs> it's going to take him a while, but once he knows, <laughs> dynamite. Oh, that was a great convo. Honestly, I really appreciate your time, Joseph and, uh, yeah. and John's as well. And, and Edwards for setting this up. And Frater RC for having me on the show. Thank you so much, guys. Like your explanations, your time. Um, I really appreciate everything. Seriously, from the bottom of my heart. Yeah, pleasure to meet you, Matt. Very nice. And, uh, you know, maybe we can try again when Edward has stable internet or something like that. 100%. I'd love to. I'd love yeah. to. Yeah, and and really Matt, if you, you know, if, if you have any other questions, if you're like, if especially, 
especially if you're going through a, a hard time, like everybody in the outer order, if, if you don't go through a hard time, you're going to go through a hard time later. Uh, so <laughs> like any challenges that you have any, like, you know, or if you just want to say that you're succeeding happily or something like that, please, we please reach out. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Very cool. Yeah. All right. I don't know. I guess I'll, uh, Maybe I'll just send this recording to Edward and he can stitch it into the first part or something. Yeah. Um, I'd like awesome. to see how he edits it. Who knows, folks? I don't know how you're going to hear this stuff, but somehow you'll hear it. <laughs> Take care, guys. Cheers. All right. All right. Peace. See you Play later. In extension. Thanks. Good seeing you again, RC. Yeah, likewise, Joe. All right. Peace, guys. <laughs>